probably be no more than two hours and all three trucks will be full. And sure enough, uh, South Central LA at, the, at that time, this was 1999, just stray dogs just walking everywhere, which is quite common in, in poor areas. So um, I filmed a lot of it. I shot some of it on Super 8, which was a format a while back, and, uh, <laughs> and video and all this stuff. And um, and uh, I filmed some euthanasia because they bring them in and they and they euthanize them. And um, the trick for me was because I was just going to make a public service announcement about spaying and neutering. The trick was when they took the bodies into a refrigerated room, and there was something about seeing domestic animals, what we would call domestic animals, predominantly dogs and cats in a refrigerator. That seeing dogs and cats in a refrigerator made me think of meat. And um, I went to bed that night and I thought, this stuff's all connected. This stuff's all, this stuff's all really connected. I'm always baffled why things being connected is such an epiphany for all of us. Somehow we've gotten so accustomed to separate existence, separate everything. Everything is separate, separate, separate. Um, that it's a revolutionary concept to think that everything is, is totally connected. And I laid in bed and I thought, someone should put together a film that covers everything. It should be like the encyclopedia of the issue. Someone should just do it and it should be the non-fiction film. It should be truth. It should be radical truth, if, if need be. It should tell, shouldn't sugarcoat it at all. I said, someone should really, should go do this. Someone should go make this film. And I laid there and thought, holy crap, I gotta make this movie. And um, I edited uh, Earthlings in a garage in Burbank. And um, I spent five years on it. I worked on it myself. I'm a single father. I have a daughter. She was seven months old. She would be sleeping, and I had a little baby monitor. And I would. Um, they say if you're if you're a parent, um, I was a single parent, and she, I was raising her, that you should sleep when your child sleeps because you don't get any sleep otherwise. So those of you who have kids, you know what I'm talking about. But I was working on this movie, and so I would see her breathing with the little red lights, while I would look at. Horrible, horrible, horrible images. And sometimes I get footage sent to me and I just weep. I just, I put it in, I just weep. For those of you who've seen the film, there's a shot of a dog being thrown into the back of a garbage truck. This took place in Turkey. And um, I just wept as I just, I just wept as I watched it. And I thought, okay, so import it, uh, digitize it, synthesize it, put it on a timeline. Um, maybe start here, maybe end there. And, and it's a sort of a mathematical process editing. It's seconds. It's down to the frame in a second. And I was grateful that a camera was there in Turkey when that dog was shot. It's a really poor quality shot. It's very grainy. And because um, that dog is surrounded by heartless faces at that supreme moment, but um, there was a camera present. And I don't know how many people have witnessed that animal's death since then and if it's had a positive effect. Um, because of it. This is the power of, of a documentary film, which is what my colleagues are, are talking about. Now, on, on the one hand, I don't know if you guys feel the same, but uh, I come to something like this, this conference, I get super pumped up. I was at the Planner Aids, these guys are talking, I mean, there's rock stars, you know, all of them are just so powerful, they're doing legislation, they're picking up animals, they're taking them out, and I just get really pumped up, and I go home, and I just sit at the computer in the dark, and I just move a shot <laughs> and that's all I do so it's sometimes I feel it's completely in, in, uh, inefficient and, and uh, I feel like I want to hold the beings and look in their eyes because I couldn't do what I do without the unnamed and unknown undercover investigators who go in who don't get any of the praises or awards those go to celebrities those go to certain figures that draw attention from the media but these are the real people that go in and get jobs in these places they have to sometimes abuse the animals while they're working in these places to gain the trust of the colleagues that they're there because they're watching them extremely closely. I knew of one activist, and I'm gonna paraphrase this story a little bit. He shot some footage for us for Earthlings and he had to get a job at one of these places. This had to do with where they were training the elephants and, um, and the footage is in the film. I'm gonna paraphrase this, but, um, but they told him on his day of orientation that, hey, if we find out you work for an animal rights group, we're gonna take you in the woods and no one's ever gonna hear from you. These are people who entertain our children, incidentally. <laughs> he was working as a vet tech because the only way to get an elephant to stand on a ball, which he has no frame of reference for in the wild, is to either beat it or withhold food. So they have to bring in vets to help clean them up after before they take them out to entertain everybody. So we work with a vet tech, or this one vet tech that we worked with, who worked with another group, got in there and he worked there for several weeks or months, 
and gain that relationship of trust with them before he finally began to bring in a little tiny hidden camera and document the training of the elephants is what you see in the film. One day they spotted that camera on him. These are good old boys. Gun racks in the truck, antlers on the hood, the whole works. They chased him three counties. Um, pulling up in front of the hotels, running through, going out the back to get another, I mean, the whole thing. When all that is said and done, and the animals have been abused and killed, and the activists and the animal rights groups are all doing it, and guys like us raise some money and we try to put it together, and distributors don't want to show it because it's not sexy, and there's all these other things that they want to watch, and all you do is you hope is that someone somewhere might sit down and maybe take a look at it, and maybe, maybe they'll make a different decision in life. I'm not personally a religious person in terms of organized religious belief, but I will quote the Buddha here for a moment who said, the greatest miracle on earth is to change a single thought. The greatest miracle on earth is to change a single thought is because we are so identified with our thoughts, which are taught, which are all taught, but we somehow identify with them. And you can imagine what we're up against when we're trying to get new people to consider, to consider making a shift like this, which is why I always suggest compassion, having compassion for this great ignorance that they have, and educating and planting seeds. Seeds sometimes we plant on stony ground, Seeds will, seeds will sometimes be planted on rich, fertile soil. Keep planting seeds. Keep planting seeds. And um, I hope, as Keegan has said, as Mark has said, that each of you here will consider using the power of media, not just social media, but perhaps making a film. More books, more films, more activists, more sanctuaries, more authors. What are we, one, two? I know we're under 5%, right? We've got to get to that 10% tipping point. I was at a, a, a panel not too long ago with another director named Ridley Scott, big movie director, Gladiator, The Martian, Exodus, and he said something, he, he, he had pulled no punches. He said, you have no excuse. You have no excuse. Just like he said, you can go to Best Buy. You can get a camera at Best Buy. Orson Welles never had that quality, ever. He'd be rolling in his grave right, grave right now. <laughs> Your editing stuff is free, and you can distribute it. And you can distribute online. So, each of you is only you. That's a little zen and kind of weird, but each of you <laughs> can only see things the way you see it. Share it with us. Share it with us. Consider sharing it with us. And um, hope that people will see it. Hope that people will see it, but certainly make it. My most recent effort is a film that maybe, it's not well known yet as Earthlings, it's called Unity. I believe very strongly in this film because it is part of the trilogy. Earthlings was always a trilogy. That's why on the poster you see nature, animals, humankind. So it was, it was a little clue right from the beginning. One film for the animals, that's Earthlings. One film for humankind, that's Unity. One film for nature, which is still to come. This will be the Earthlings trilogy. And I, want, I encourage you, if you haven't seen Unity, to please take a look at it because it's where I talked about a moment ago about separation. Sometimes we're separated even from each other as activists. Carl Sagan, the great astronomer, was right when he said, if you want to bake a, an apple pie, you must first have a universe. Maybe some of you have heard that. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> there is no apple without a tree. There's no tree without a seed. There's no seed growing without soil. There's no soil without water. No, uh, no uh, growth without air, a firmament, an atmosphere, a sun, a solar system, a galaxy, nebula, quasars, a universe. How can we possibly think that each of us are not connected when we say nature, when we use the word nature, nature is not separate selves. We don't think of nature as an individual rock or an individual tree or an individual insect or bird. When we think of nature, we think of all of it as one. It's why I call the first film Earthlings. It's why I call the second film Unity. It's why the third film is called Beings. These are words that you cannot divide. They cannot be split apart. You could be the Queen of England or you could be a, you could be a dung beetle. There's no separation. And that's the theme of our second film, Unity, No Separation, based on form, which is why we love some things and teach love and compassion and sympathy and in the same breath 
have an attitude of aggression toward other beings. One last comment, and then I'll wrap it up. When I was uh, working on Unity, when I was first writing it, I read a story of a Nazi soldier. He um, sent uh, people to the gas chambers and to the ovens. There was a little 10-year-old girl. Her family had been killed in the concentration camp. 10-year-old girl. She was walking too slowly to the ovens because of the psychic violence that she witnessed and the impact it had on her. And his impatience with her moving too slowly, he rifle butts her in the back of the head so she will move quicker toward her death. He had two 10-year-old daughters at home. He was known to be a loving, compassionate, gentle father. I found that amazing. It wasn't the violence that I found so extraordinary. It was his capacity for love that I found so interesting. The human capaci capacity for violence and compassion is extraordinary. That's why we quote people like Gandhi. That's also why we reference people like Hitler, contemporaries. Two prime examples of the range of human consciousness. But the capacity is there. The capacity for greatness is right there. Jesus said, again, I'm not quoting this from a religious standpoint, it's just a quote. Everything you have seen me do, you can do. Even more than you have seen me do, you can do. Every one of you is an activist. Every one of you is born witness and continues to because today you spend your time in a place like this. Thank you very much. For